Good evening, everyone. Greetings. <laughs> nice to see you all here. I'm Colleen Cosmo Murphy, and welcome to another special Classic Album Sundays event here at the British Library. So great to be back, and we've never hosted an event in this room. We're usually in the auditorium where we've hosted events with Jazzy B from Soul to Soul, Louis Vega, John Grant, Paloma Faith, and so many more, but I'm especially excited about tonight's guest. Um, first, a little bit about Classic Album Sundays. We've been telling the stories behind our favorite albums since 2010 when I founded it. We host listening sessions and listening events around the world. We also have an online album club for our Patreon members, and our website hosts artists interview videos, playlists, podcasts, and blogs all about the elixir of life, music. Now, the British uh, Library is also presenting a range of events that are all linked to Irish culture and to Ireland. And that will culminate at the end of this month with the Irish Writers Festival. So, joining us tonight is an Irish artist, of course. She cut her teeth as half of the duo Maloko. She's released a string of solo albums that has her own brand of avant-garde electronica, art pop, and edgy disco, of course, including her latest, Roisin Machine. And tonight we're going to explore some of the artists and the musical stepping stones that have inspired her music. We'll also explore some of her own songs that have been kind of key significant pieces of work along her musical career and as part of her evolution as an artist. And at the very end, we'll give you the opportunity to ask your own questions. So let's give a very big heartfelt welcome to Roisin Murphy. Thank you so much for coming along tonight. Thank you for spending some time with us. You're so welcome. <laughs> now, you've really been kicking it lately. I mean, we checked your Instagram feed. There you are, hanging out with Janet Jackson, doing the after party for Balenciaga. Also, that stunning, stunning performance at Glastonbury. I mean, let's just give her another round of applause, right? <laughs> How does it feel? I mean, you are at the top of the world right now. It's the same as it always is. I'm just <laughs> always busy, always creating, mm -hmm. uh, juggling everything, being a mom and all those things. Yes, yeah, being a mom along all si alongside all of this. Yeah. Also, you, are, you have a role in a new Netflix series. Do you want to tell us a little I bit about do. that? Yes, I'm playing a witch, <laughs> <laughs> an Irish witch. Yes, well, she has, she is, yeah, and um, she's based on my father's sister. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so that was fun. That was great fun. Is it called the the bastard son and the devil himself? That's the name. And it's out on Netflix now, so you have to you have to watch that. Kind of good for the Halloween spirit. It sounds. That's right. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Well, tonight we're gonna to take a look and listen to some of the music that's really inspired you and also your own work itself. And uh, the first song that we're featuring is one that you picked is Shirley Bassey. And uh, if you go away, Nomi Kipa, uh, which is on her um, album, her 1967 album, And We Were Lovers. And it's a beautiful song, absolutely beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about how this song inspired you and when you first heard it? Well, my father was uh, a big fan of Shirley Bassey. And Shirley Bassey was always on the TV when I was a kid. And uh, she's, you know, I mean, her vocal on this is exceptional and perfect, really. Um, and I used to always see her on the television and be entranced by her as a child. And um, and I found this record at a car boot sale uh, in Manchester, and I sort of bought it to kind of play to me dad because I knew me dad loved her, mm -hmm. and um, I, I think she was the kind of woman he wanted to 
he wanted to die with with somebody <laughs> like <laughs> Shirley Bassey, or in a or in a Ferrari. I think that's what his dream was. But <laughs> but he, so yeah, no, and that song, I didn't know that it was Jacques Brel mm -hmm. when I first heard it, um, and it's a translation, um, but. It's been influential, I think. Yeah. I think it's sort of a bit sing it back. Uh, sing it back's a bit it. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of total surrender mm -hmm. of love, the total just acceptance that you actually don't have free will mm -hmm. and you can't control who you fall in love with and how much you love them. And I think that's kind of really central to a lot of my songwriting. Um, Maybe I'm trying to make make up for being such a bad badass <laughs> in the rest of my life, but when I fall in love, I'm a I'm, you know I'm a I'm a I'm a puppy. <laughs> I'm I'm I, I'd have been in the shadow of your dog just to keep you by my side, <laughs> as she says. Yeah. And and also I went to a amazing um, sorry uh, voice coach years ago, singing coach years ago, just two or three times, and her name was Elena, and she worked with Shirley, and I would be singing at the grand piano with her, and I'd see this, like, picture of Shirley Bassey on the grand piano, <laughs> the hands out like this, <laughs> and, and Elena told me that, that she worked with Shirley to, to do that, or, no, she didn't actually, she didn't claim that. She said that Shirley did that naturally. And that that, she explained to me that the voice can come through the body and not just through your mouth, you know? And it really changed me. And I think, because um, I love Shirley Bassey as well, I think I was sort of in the beginning of Maloko, I was, oh, you see me dancing, I thought it was really cool to be always like this. You know, I was like that. <laughs> and then suddenly I was like that. Oh, yeah. and, and it was to sort of help with singing as much as anything else, but it's really fed into a lot more of the way that I perform. And mm -hmm. it's one of the archetypes, I guess, that I, I play with. Mm. Now, that song, was it a special song for you and, and Mark Bryden from Maloko? Because he remixed it. In Did 2000, he? yeah. There's a Shirley Bassey compilation of remixes called Diamonds Are Forever. Ah, yes. And Coming he back to actually me, yeah. remixes that song under, under a different alias. Yeah, well, that might have been because I loved that song, yeah, right. I think. So it's something that you played when you yes, were together. to him, yeah, yeah. Right. But that lyric, you know, I'd have been in the shadow of your dog mm. if I thought it might have mm -hmm. kept you by my side. You know, this also that conversational element to the songwriting. Mm. That's you get a lot in European songwriting. Like I figured out when I was doing Italian songs. For me, Senti. Yes. Your six, I did, yeah, your EP. I did a, a, a Italian EP, sing, singing other people's songs mostly in Italian. But I am realizing that the content was very conversational was very close and uh, yeah I've been influenced by that type of thing second half maybe of my career let's say or starting sort of toward the end of Maloko well let's have a listen to the song yeah shall we it's amazing isn't it I mean I'm just listening to it and I'm thinking there's an awful lot to be said for having to be better than everybody else. Yeah. The precision yeah. there, and you can hear her playing with the microphone, like with the sound, with the compression, that she knows like about frequency even, to that detail, to that level, not just notes, mm -hmm. but how the voice is going to react to this and the compressor and the, and the tape, and like without knowing, knowing all those things, but just, no, like a producer would know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, 
yeah, I mean, having to be better than everybody else. I think she probably had to be better than everybody else. I think Dusty Springfield was also a lot like that Felt as well. That way too. Because she actually produced a lot of her own albums, but she never wanted to give herself the credit because she thought people wouldn't like her anymore. And <laughs> she said, because she said, you know, you don't want to get too big for your britches kind of thing. Um, but also, she did. She, she had a great engineer as well, so she wanted to give him some respect. But she knew exactly how the records should be produced, how the band should work. She would instruct the band. So a similar, a similar thing. I'm just thinking of women, you know, female musicians and singers in the late 1960s. You know, they might just look like, oh, everyone. They just, they just sing the song. But no, yeah. they're a lot of them were behind a lot, much more than just singing the song. I mean, I think listening as well to the song there it reminded me of the first time I saw it, I heard it. And I didn't know when it was finishing. You know, it keeps finishing. Mm -hmm. And then it starts again. Mm -hmm. And this thing like ec that structure echoing the idea of the song as well, the idea of the thing finishes, but it begins. It mm -hmm. finishes, but begins. Mm -hmm. um, and that suspense when it finally ends, is this really the end, you know? That's so clever. It is very clever. It reflects the lyrics. Yeah, it's really great. And lots of drama, which I can hear in your music as well. Drama, yes. <laughs> it's all subjective. <laughs> well, the next song is all about drama, that's for sure. I Come mean, it's on, on the opposite side of the spectrum. <laughs> I mean, when this song was released in 1969, it's a debut single by the Stooges, Iggy Pop's first band. A song, you know, we say the Stooges, probably along with the MC5, helped invent punk rock. And uh, there's only three chords on the, for most of this song, so it does sound like a, a lot of punk rock. But it's produced by John Cale, who also plays sleigh bells, and a single piano note throughout the whole thing, too. So you almost get like a drone-like effect mixed with this punk rock. Of course, the song is the Stooges, I Want to Be Your Dog. What a great song. And why did you choose this as one of your seminal tracks that you were inspired by? God, it just was visceral when I first heard it. I used to go to a nightclub called um, Isabella's in, uh, in Manchester. Uh, it was the first nightclub that I, I used to go to, and it was a psychedelic club, actually, and they played lots of um, garage rock, and they played modern stuff as well, like the Pixies and Mud Honey and the, you know... Um, pre kind of grungy stuff, Sonic Youth and Dinosaur Jr. and uh, all that kind of thing. Well, mixed with MC5, mixed, mi and this came on one time, and I just thought it was perfect. It was just perfect to dance to in the way that we danced to, to stuff there, and it was because it kind of had, like, you, you could mosh to it, but you could also do, like, psychedelic sort of fucking 60s stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I just found it perfect, perfect. And the lyric, it, you know, everybody says about Iggy's writing that he's just so direct and to the point. The idea is this, and there's no question. Like, and again, we have this sort of submissive thing that I like, <laughs> I don't know, um, that is romantic. Mm. It's very romantic that he wants to be her dog. Giving oh. yourself over to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's so funky and it's, you like you say, it's sort of, it's like drone, it anticipates a lot more than, than just punk. Mm. It's mm. super influential record. Uh, is really funky, really jazzy. I was going to say, if we can listen to it, we should also listen to it to only the left side and only the right side, who uh, I have to give props. Leila Arab, do you know this producer, Leila? Mm -hmm. He was yeah. on Warp. Yeah, yeah. She told me this, and it's true, and she showed me that one side, on the left side of the stereo, it's like jazz, and on the right side, or I don't know which way around it is, but anyway, on the right side, it's, um, it's rock. Um, and they're like two different records if you separate them, so let's see if we can do that. <laughs> well, we'll try that, yeah, let's try that in the middle of the song. But one, one thing I wanted to ask about Iggy in, in particular, have you ever seen him perform live? I have, I saw him with the Stooges mm -hmm. when they were doing Raw Power. 
they were doing a tour where they were doing Raw Power, but they did uh, did a few other things as well. And um, it, he did, they didn't disappoint at all. It was unbelievable. I mean, his energy, he used to, for those of you that don't know, he would sometimes mutilate himself on stage. I mean, one, one gig, he carved an X into his chest in LA, you know, brought to the hospital. And of course, I mean, his drug taking in the 70s is, is well known, but he was, as a performer, the energy level and the control that he has. Yeah. Is that an inspiration to you as it's well? It's the commitment. It's the commitment. It's the fact of when I, go, I bet he thinks, like I do sometimes, which is when I go out on stage, I'll not talk about drama, but I sometimes think, or I do always think, it could be that I die on the stage tonight. Mm. Be careful, watch the edge of the stage when you're falling all over the thing. You know, where is it? How high up is it? You know, like, because I want to lose it. So, and you're in heels. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes I might be in the high heel as well. But yeah, I take that from him. I mean, I, any, any, video footage of him performing, anything. It's like he's gone out there and he could die. You know, he could die. And when I saw him, he was well into his, I'd say he was 60 when I saw him playing, or even more. Mm. And he was like a bullet from a gun, from the minute he went out to the minute he went off. And that is what, what I want to be, mm -hmm. honestly. Well, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a listen to the song. So, Francis, maybe somewhere in the middle, you can like just uh, put it all to the left. You know, just isolate, drop one one channel, so you can have a listen. I mean, talking about Iggy as as a performer, and you are a fabulous performer. Um, you really spend a lot of time on the performance aspect of performing. It's not just playing the song. Do you prefer performing on stage to working in the studio? No, I think they're perfect sort of counterbalance, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, I, enjoy, I enjoy the two sides of it. This is two sides of a coin. And what about the, in terms of the performance side, what is, do you have like a, a mission when you go out on stage, before you go out on stage? Is there something that you think of that to kind of get you motivated or is there some way that you want to connect with the audience? Oh, it's, it's really like a perfume, you know, honestly, it's all these millions of things you're trying to achieve at once, honestly. Like some freedom, some precision, some flow state, I think, is probably what you want. And when you say flow state, that's, that's what I try to achieve when I'm, when I'm DJing as well, so you're not thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're doing more than you ever do. Mm -hmm. at the same time, but you're not actually thinking about it, then yeah. it's brilliant, yeah. Yeah. Okay, now your next choice is another one. I mean, I love all this diversity of, of, of the songs, by the way, and they're ticking a lot of boxes for me personally. And I remember when I, when I picked up this record, uh, I don't know, 30 years ago, it was the most expensive record I'd ever bought at that point. It was $30. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've spent more on, on records <laughs> now, so. on single records. <laughs> but this whole, this, whole album, this whole EP is fantastic. It's Gwen Guthrie. And Gwen Guthrie, amazing artist. She's, she's a songwriter as well. She wrote for Sister Sledge, Angela Bofill, Roberta Flack, uh, I think Aretha Franklin as well, um, she, Benny King. She also did BVs for Aretha Franklin, backing vocals, Madonna, Stevie Wonder. And then she had her own solo career as well. And she worked extensively with Sly and Robbie, uh, Sly Dunbar and Robbie Shakespeare, the duo that were part of the session band at Compass Point Studios, uh, Chris Blackwell from Island's recording studio in the Bahamas. And a lot of the songs feature Sly and Robbie, and this special EP are all remixes by the then Paradise Garage DJ, Larry Levan. And um, can you tell us a bit about why you picked this song, Seventh Heaven? Well, it's like a zenith in sound. The mix, the, the Larry Levan mix is, I, I heard it many times, I think, on the dance floor in, in Sheffield before I met Mark Bryden. 
And then when I met Mark and we were kind of talking, oh, I love this song and I love that song. And I said, oh, I love that song, Seventh Heaven. And he was like, I love that song too. And we were really bonded. It was a romantic song for us, I'm being honest. <laughs> really? And then, yeah, he had this, he had a great record collection. He had this on vinyl, the, mm -hmm. the EP. And it became a massive influence for me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, something that really sort of more clicked into place as a solo artist when I went into um, Overpowered and so on. Um, just trying to get anywhere near something as beautiful as this is, you know, a lifetime's mm. ambition. And um, sonically, this is all very expensive, you know. Try, try to remember that, you know. We don't have the bloody money to make music like this anymore. Uh, and most of the stuff that it was recorded on isn't, you can't get it anymore, it doesn't even exist. And like I'm not a, what's a sonify, a son, what's a sound f fetishist? Audiophile. Audiophile. I am. Um, <laughs> but I can hear proper frequencies and I've always been able to hear it I think even as a child I knew when something sounded amazing particularly in the situation of a recording um, and I'm always trying to get this from the people that I work with that's why I go to the mad fellas that I go to to make records with mm -hmm. now Musically, is this something that may have also inspired your latest album, Roisin Machine? Yeah, I, I definitely, definitely is inspired Parrot, a big, big influence of Parrot. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the extended, ver the extendedness of it. Just um, the fact that he did a remix album, you know, for, oh, we did from, a remix album. so it's very similar to Larry Levant taking yeah, Gwen this Guthrie's was a, this work. was a reference, obviously. I hate even saying that. It's like, you can't say it. <laughs> we were like talking about <laughs> peanut butter and this and that. So now, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's embarrassing to even try and sound like this. Should we listen to it? It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> we love that one. My gosh. Even her vocal delivery, though, that w what about her vocal delivery appeals to you? Because I can hear oh, I just, you how know. that might inspire you as well. Yeah, I think. It's funny, you know, when I was listening to these records then, I didn't understand them at all. And just, like, it's a long time ago, and I've learned it a good bit, and I still don't really understand them, but I understand them a lot more. Uh, what's, why is it that I love it? Why is it that I love her singing? Why do I want to be that light and precise and, yeah, soulful, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it's nice to kind of get older in some ways too. It doesn't take anything away from hearing music for me that I understand a little bit more about the process and what the parts are and what's playing what and why it sounds like this. And when I listened to it years ago, I wouldn't have known what was going on with those drums as much as I perhaps don't know now, but I know a little bit. Mm. You know, I know that there's a delay on it and I know that there's like, it's genius the way that it's sort of wonky, but it still works. Cause mm. you know, there's a lot of house that later that sounds a bit like that that's got this kind of like wonky delay mm -hmm. and it's really nice a lot most of the time actually that early house with the wonky delays on the everything but it's never as good as that <laughs> you know that is just perfect it's perfectly wonky you know mm -hmm. so that's a difficult thing to get but it's interesting what you said, like the more you know about music and how it's made, it doesn't make you like it less. It almost no. can become more magical. Yeah. You know, yeah. you think, how do they do that? You know? Well, it's a language, endless kind of language that you're learning, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It never stops. Mm -hmm. And some, we were talking because we were looking at some books <laughs> in there with that have, you know, with um, writing, the music writing, what's it called? Yeah. <laughs> Musical notation. <laughs> Musical notation. And, um, you know, it's, I was saying it's a language, and then, what did you say? Something like it's more than that. It's like, but it's like 
multi-dimensional. Yeah, it is multi-dimensional, yeah. And then people can even, they, they can just write it just without even hearing it. They'll know exactly what a high E sounds like. They'll know exactly That's what it sounds perfect, like and, and yeah. the, 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 the tempo and the timing and everything. Just yeah. to be able to write it out as you would be able to, you know, write a book is quite But incredible. it's not just that, is it? And with recording, recorded music, there's all these other languages as well. There's these technical languages, the studio languages, all that. And... Uh, so that it's just multi-dimensional, you know. There's not just notes or bangs. It's just it goes on and on. How many bangs and how many notes you can have, and how they can different they can sound, and the frequencies of notes. Or there's millions of them in there, and all that. But it's it doesn't get any more. Yeah, it's, I'm definitely one of those people that gets up every day and listens to music every day, and I still love it. I love it if I'm on my own. I love it if I'm with people. I, you know, I still love it. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, it's always sad to go into a home with no music and no books. Um, <laughs> Unless they haven't got good taste. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's better True. if they don't True. have the stuff. Maybe it'll be a good thing then. <laughs> <laughs> Power cut. <laughs> You're talking about producers, which kind of leads me into the next one, who is uh, the production is by, it's Dr. Octagon, which is Cool Keith. And it's produced by Dan Nakamura, who's uh, Dan the Automator, and also Cutmaster Kurt. And it's the song 3000. And um, a really interesting, interesting record. Kind of like an American version of what was like the trip hop scene, but it did come out on James Lavelle's label, Moax. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about why you picked this song? It was very influential on me, you know. Um I think the fact that the, the whole album was a concept album, and I haven't really done that, but it, the way that he went looking for words and concepts and ideas before in terms of writing, you know, you can hear that he, you know, he's got loads of like medical stuff and science stuff and mathematical stuff and philosophical stuff mm. in there. And he had an idea that he wanted to pursue and he, and he researched, and I think that influenced me. Say when it came to, I'd be reading something about oxytocin, you know, and I'd think, ah, oh, I'll write a song about that. I think that influenced me, because I listened to this album over and over and over and over and over and over again. I just found it the most exciting, like, modern, forward-thinking, thing you know when I heard it I just thought Jesus you know there was no like outcast or anything like that there was no there wasn't anything like this at all yeah. and yeah I mean that's that's all Keith I'm talking about I mean Automator and what's the other guy's name yeah uh, cut Master Kurt Master Kurt did the most brilliant is he the scratchy guy then yeah, who yeah, yeah. Oh, and there's Qbert who's doing all the scratches as well right Yes. The scratches are just unbelievable on this record, the whole album. And um, I picked, what did I pick, 3,000? Yeah, 3,000. Yeah, I mean, I could have picked a lot of different tracks off that album, but um, yeah, because of the forward momentum of the idea and the lyric, like that was what the whole thing gave me, this, I, this modernist, this um, futurist um, look, look outside of now, look forward, look outside of the planet, you know, mm -hmm. um, that I just love. I, I find that very positive and, um, yeah, I, I guess I, I, yeah, I believe in people, so I, I sort of really like modern stuff. Mm -hmm. Janelle Monet does it very well as well uh, with her concept albums. Would you ever consider, like, playing a part, a persona, on uh, a record. Well, I have done in, in songs, obviously. Right. Yeah. That's true. Which songs can you think of of your own that you think that you've really had to put another hat on? Oh, God, there's a good few, actually. Um, but most obvious coming to my mind is Mother Dear, I think it's called, on the first Maloko album. Mm -hmm. Is it the first or second? <laughs> and my mother was appalled because it's like about somebody who's going to therapy about their mother and they want to basically kill their mother and all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And my mother was like, dip, 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 dip. everybody thinks that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
he said, Mom, I'm just <laughs> no, playing a it's part. Not, it's not at all, me mammy. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was just a fantasy. I'm trying to think of a few more. There's a few. There's a good few, I okay, think. Well, why don't we play the record? You can think of which, one, which other ones yeah. uh, that, that come to mind. So let's have a listen. And so, now, so now when, you know, I think if somebody says, or is there something that's very modern or very fresh or just like very futurist, you know, then I'll always go, yeah, because rap moves on to the year 3000, you know? Ah, <laughs> there you go. I mean, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Just jumping in there with 3000. This was even before 2000. That was before <laughs> 2000, yeah. Yeah, this is like too close. <laughs> I think about like the David Bowie song, 1984. I remember thinking that must have seemed like so in the future with George Orwell wrote it. And then I remember playing that album on the <laughs> Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve of 1984. And it's like, here we are. We're here already. Um, we got to talk about Maloka because you were in post-punk, post-rock bands before Maloka. No, correct? I was in one, one band. band and one gig. Like, <laughs> and it was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> It was actually brilliant. <laughs> That's it great. was really brilliant. Well, it was too was good it like? to do again. What was it like? It was we were called Anne Turquoise Car Crash the <laughs> and uh, it was in a pub in, in Stockport and we did a lot of flyering and a lot of people turned up. Uh, I think because of the name of the band, I think really. And um and we hadn't rehearsed at all, not at all. And I used to go to the rehearsal room and switch the light off and get off with the bass player. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was a screamer only. And then at one point I was just going, I was, somebody was talking like as if they were in a radio and they were going to break over 911 or whatever it is. We've had an accident here, you know, because the, the band's called Car Accident. And and then I'm going, oh, my leg, my leg. <laughs> Things like that, that was it. And then I had a fight with a few people. And then they all had fights with each other and all the band ended up on the f in there and you all ended up up here. And um, it was just white noise and pink noise and we didn't know what we were doing, but everybody had a great time. <laughs> That sounds amazing. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Well, Moloko developed quite differently, and I know most of you have heard the story about how that developed in terms of, if you want to quickly tell us, just as a yeah. recap. But. I met a fella, we fell in love, and at the same time we started to record stuff, and he was, he was a, a very brilliant producer already at a big studio called Fon Studios, which on the first night that we met, we went there in the middle of the night, like 4 a.m., mm -hmm. and recorded me saying, do you like my tight sweater? <laughs> See how it fits my body. <laughs> and, and then we forgot about it for a while, and then we did another th stupid thing and another stupid thing, and then his manager brought the tape to London without saying anything, and he had put a couple of other um, instrumental things on there and called it a thing. It was called the Numbskulls. And he, he got us a record deal based on that. That is crazy. So you're kind of <sighs> learning on the job now. I mean, we're always Too learning right. on the job, but you have to, you're kind of having to fast track a bit here. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, uh, you know, you have your debut album. Well, I like didn't. Yeah. Mm. I mean, because I was just messing about yeah. until I wasn't. Like, so mm -hmm. I, when I was ready, I was well into it before I even sang. And then we were well into having put the record out, I think, when we suddenly thought, let's do a gig. So we did take it in our, stri you know, in our stride, as it were. It wasn't planned in any way. Mm -hmm. And then you, you release uh, Do You Like My Tight Sweater, then I'm Not a Doctor, which has Sing It Back, and that becomes a global club hit with a remix by Boris Lugos. Yes. Was that surprising for you when that became such a huge song in the clubs? No, it wasn't surprising when I, because the first minute I heard the remix, I knew it was a hit. I mean, I could see literally myself like a hologram in the living room on top of the pops. That was it. I'm going on top of the pops. I could see it. Wow. So I was 100% sure that was going to to catch fire, that remix, yeah. And I think I was very 
sure, and it was me that was very sure that the song had to be remixed, mm -hmm. um, and that it would be a perfect song to remix. Why did you think it needed to be remixed? So this is what, 1996, 97? Yeah, it, yeah, I'd been in New York and I'd, I'd, I'd wrote the song on a dance floor, uh, on the Body and Soul dance floor. Which dance floor? floor? The body and Soul. The Body and Soul! Yeah, oh. I really did. And I, I, Well, the lyric, sing yeah. it back, bring it back, I, I, that came to me there. And I brought this whole, but it wasn't just that, I brought this new love of house music back. A renewed love of that kind of tempo music mm -hmm. that I hadn't felt since the late 80s in Manchester or early 90s maybe where Sheffield had kind of gone it all gone a bit main room and a bit sort of Maloko was a reaction to to house music becoming very successful and sort of mediocre really mm -hmm. the scene um, and he had made house records and everything of course you know they all had in Sheffield and many of them I think most of them got burnt by it because they felt like they were gonna, they were making really important records. They really knew they were, but I think the industry thought, if they had a hit even, they thought it was, oh, it was just a fluke, mm -hmm. and this would be all over in a year or two years. So nobody was ever really given a chance to be a serious album artist if they were interested in this type of music at that point. So we were a sort of reaction to that. Mm. And then I went to New York and I went to, primarily it was really Body and Soul that, that blew me away. It was the one that I went to. I was there for six or seven weeks and I went every week to Bo Body and Soul. I even went on my own. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, mm -hmm. didn't need to go with anybody. Mm -hmm. That's the best kind of club. And um, yeah, and, and I w he, Francois, would play the big vocal tracks and things I'd never heard and then he would turn it down and everyone in the crowd would know every single word and they would sing it and they'd still be in time when he put it back on. <laughs> and stuff like that. So this was me feeling, sing it back to me, it was a good house yeah. thing, you know. And so I came back saying, I've got to do this. It was the first song we wrote for the second album. And then, and then, and then we carried on and we didn't go that way with the album. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in the end, we sort of mixed it to go back to fit more in, although it is beautiful, the version on the album. It is really lovely. Yes, yeah. It's not that clubby. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I always felt like it was a bit, because the first version we did of Sing It Back, that's a remix of Sing It Back, the one that's on the album. Mm -hmm. The first version is much more like Keep Pushing or something by Boris Delugos, you know. <laughs> It was really weird. So um, then when I heard Boris Delugosh asked for the parts, I, I knew it was going to be good. Mm. He's a great producer, really great producer. Of course, uh, Things to Make and Do is a massive album. It was a number two on the charts, I think, and the, the time is now another huge, huge hit for you. Uh, but we I want to fast forward to your album, Statues, because by this time you've put out you know, some great records. And you've been learning about the process of songwriting and production along the way. Mm -hmm. What was what did you learn about songwriting working with, with Mark? Oh God, I mean, most of it is what I learned with him. Mm -hmm. um, like the rest is all just sort of bits and bobs on top. Uh, you know, he he would pull me up about having too many you, me, things. Mm -hmm. Um, he, I didn't, I would sing and not know I was out of tune. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I would not have a, I'd be like, that's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be like, no, you're going to have to sing it in tune, Roisin. Um, <laughs> things like that, you know, structure, arrangement, no idea, come out with parts. I mean, I'm still a bit like this, honestly, much better and left to my own devices now very often on this but in the beginning no idea you know oh, it's a great part there's another great part there's another great part there's another part mm -hmm. and no arrangement and so he would know that as well and um so yeah he was just really great and he was a great player and he was great love maker 
<laughs> I was just going to ask what's your fondest memories, but true. I guess he just answered it. <laughs> So, and no, it was all a beaut. it was such a beautiful time, you know, such like when I think back on it, to be in love and to be, Jesus, and now I have an actual job as well, like, I mean, I'm not just, I'm signed to a, make a record and it was like, I and mean, we're together and we're always, we wanted to be together, we wanted, I think that's why he did it with me, because he wanted to be with me, because we wanted to be together. Now, when you did this album, Statues, this was released after your breakup, correct? Yes, yeah. It was actually written after the breakup or during, during after. And what was that experience like? Was it, it must have been very difficult. I think of Fleetwood Mac recording rumors and, and all the... It was hard, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't easy. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but everybody really brought their game, you know, to, to, the, to the show. We had poor old Eddie Stevens in the middle of it all as well. He kind of <laughs> he kept it together. He did lots of, he did all the arrangements and he even conducted the arrangements and things. I mean, it was amazing to walk in and see him standing with like a 50 piece orchestra all around him, conducting his own arrangements and so we'd known him for a few years and given him more and more and more to do within the recording of the music as we'd gone along. And so he was kind of a good middleman and he's always, a, he's always the most straight down the line person that I know. Um, but it was hard, yeah, there were ups and downs, really. Yeah, it was tricky. And did, it, did you feel vulnerable kind of like pouring your heart out on a record? No, I think we all were ready to pour our hearts out. Mm -hmm. We just were ready to uh, just pour our hearts out. I mean, we were just really like, also we'd come creatively to that point too, not just, it was a together thing. Mm -hmm. I had tried so many different characters, like I was saying, and ideas out to discover about songwriting along the way. And it was starting to egg at me, you know, it was starting to make me, you need to let more of yourself out, you need to be more emotionally, you, I wanted that anyway. And then of course this was all happening, so uh, it was just happened to coincide that we wanted that. And I think Mark wanted that too, he wanted to show how brilliant he was, how brilliant he was, you know. And the depth of what went on making that record was, was really, I mean, the mastering guy nearly had a breakdown. He just kept coming in going, I don't know what to do with it. You know, because there was that many like layers in it. And, and he was also, anybody who got drawn into that record got like completely focused and obsessed. Anyone who got drawn into it. Um, and and, it, and it, it, didn't, it didn't do that well when it came out. It wasn't seen as part of the zeitgeist when it came out. But it's a magic record. And, and also it was a very expensive record, a very serious record. And um, at some point during the 90s, maybe toward the late 90s, People started saying things like, keep it simple, stupid. Like intelligent people, like really like brilliant people got obsessed with catching the wave of somewhere between brilliant and commercial. And the best records that I think that were ever like that, things like Feel Love, let's say, the Marauder record, mm -hmm. they're not really made with that knowledge, you know, they don't, they're not, they're, there's a sense of accident that happens as well. And you don't really get anywhere when you, when you, I think, you don't really get, you can't go that far with that sort of attitude. You can't keep creating and keep being interested in it, in it yourself if you're going to be that simplistic. But yeah, 
it was hard and then we put it out and it was hard actually it was hard when we put it out because you also had to do a lot of the kind of promo i suppose because you had split up well we had a great expectation for it mm -hmm. and it didn't didn't really live up to that in, when we first released it it'll live forever i do believe that now as a record but um yeah it just didn't fit it just didn't fit in with anything at the time and um and then we, but then we toured and we had the best tour we ever had. We toured for like two years and we went everywhere and we killed everywhere. We killed like, again, like everyone involved in it was just like, right, this might be the end, you know, and just like went for it. Well, the song that you selected is Forevermore. We were, we were talking about Francois K earlier. He did a wonderful dance mix of that, which, which I still... Which I play it, more than this, I, I, played I it have in New to York. say. Yeah, I just played it in New York last week. And I sing such it. such a great tune. I sing over that Francois version so much. But this is also incredible. Mm -hmm. And um, going back to Eddie as well, the, uh, the, the arrangement, the brass arrangement on this, it's mm. unbelievable. But the actual song arrangement took an awful lot of time to figure out. Maybe it didn't actually, not the arrangement of the long version, but the bloody edit was a nightmare. <laughs> Trying to do a radio edit. That's not always a, yeah. a very unfun job because you have to be Sometimes ruthless. Sometimes it, it falls into place, but with a song like this, with all that different build coming and coming and then another thing comes on top and another thing. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah, I don't think we got the radio edit right. I think I could probably do a better one now, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> well, let's have a listen. Anything you'd like to, to not mention? Not the radio we... edit. <laughs> not, not the radio edit. Okay, let's have a listen. <laughs> it's such a dense production. It's, it's very it's Trevor like a, Horn. I think that's it? what it is. Very Trevor Horn, the whole thing was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it was with the mastering engineer. It was like, if I get rid of if I emphasize this frequency, I lose that frequency. <laughs> <laughs> so I, he spent weeks sweating and crying like his heart was broke. <laughs> Bless him. But, um, yeah, I mean, to hear, I mean, that was just dong, 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 when we wrote the song. Mm -hmm. It was the first song we wrote, actually, for this album. And um, ah, there was a whole, it was a whole heartbreaking night, that, actually, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, and, but yeah, and, but I, I think so much of Eddie when I hear this, like his melodies there and the breath. And his little funny feet and doing his little spins and that and his bowler hat and then jumping up on the, then the Hammond organ was of course the, another member of the band at this point. So jumping up onto the Hammond and playing it with his feet and stuff like that. I'm just think of him that way. I was just standing there in front of the orchestra. Um, just seeing him like really shine. Because he was so important to us. And in the sense of, well, from Loco, when we started, we were a duo, electronic duo. And it's not that easy to turn a record like, do you like my tight sweater? or that any of our records into a live thing, or any of my records, actually, any of my solo records. It's nigh on impossible, actually. It's virtually impossible, um, with sensitivity, anyway. You know, without bludgeoning it to death, its most obvious elements or whatever. Um, and he, ca we had a very bad time. Well, we had a good time. We had a band first that was like guys from Sheffield. They were brilliant in the sense that they couldn't play anything to do with the record, but they could play A stuff, yeah? And so we kind of muddled together this very dubby, punky version of the songs that were on the first album that we made and toured it. And, but it was just nothing like our, our music. And when Eddie came in, he was somehow able, he became our musical director immediately. And he was somehow able to bit nod to the record, <laughs> more than nod to the records. But it was amazing as well. Um, we had a time in between where we tried to make it like the record and, and we didn't have Eddie and it was rubbish. It was like a lot of session players playing quite nicely, 
not as much parts as we usually have on the record, etc. But when Eddie came in, and it wasn't just that, he just made us enjoy touring. Uh, when you first go out on tour when you're 20 years old and you just think, what? Well, so you get on the bus, sorry, hang on, you get on the bus in England and you drive to another country, yeah, and you play that night, yeah, and then you get on the bus again, you go to another country and you play that night when you arrive the next <laughs> night. <laughs> and you Not just as think, glamorous. this is like the hardest thing that ever you know I haven't I don't where do you, you and you're, you're supposed to sleep when exactly like and when you're moving ah so anyway it was um it was a learning curve but when he came it was like if it you know have fun let's let's all do some have a mosh pit to I want to be your dog in the little back lounge of the bus <laughs> afterwards and it made it just really great fun and because I think you can have fun when you've done the work previously, when you've put the work into the rehearsals and put the work into the set, put the work into the way the set flows and then you can have fun. It's always all in the preparation. It is. It totally is. Now, during Maloko and, and afterwards throughout your solo career, you've also collaborated with a lot of different people. Uh, during Maloko, you collaborated with Boris Lugos for one of his own tunes that you, you co-wrote with him. You uh, collaborated with David, uh, David Byrne and Fatboy Slim, The Feeling, Dave Morales, The Crookers, a, a lot of different people, Freeform Five, but also Handsome Boy Modeling School, which is a, a project of Dan the Automator, who we were talking about yeah. earlier along with Prince Paul. Can you tell us how that came about? Um, just, just Dan reached out and wanted me to do a song. And I was like, what? Because you know how much of a fan I was of, of Dr. Octagon. Mm -hmm. And then Prince Paul, you know, I, I was a huge fan of his as well. I was like a dream, but obviously I was petrified. So, uh, Why were said, you petrified? I had no reason to be actually in the end, but um, I had to go to I had to go to San Francisco to record it. But I was very prepared. Um, it, I wrote the song on my four track, and it was literally exactly as it went down, and it took like two takes. But they both of them came to the airport to pick me up. They're hilarious as well. And I didn't know what way to take them and everything, and it was all a bit much. And then they'd straight to the studio in Dan's house, straight to the booth, literally. I hardly sat down, went in, and then it was done, like. And then they did nothing to it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. The groove just went round and round and round and round. <laughs> J-Live was where he was, and everything was where I put it. Uh -huh. And... I found that very refreshing, mm. honestly. The no fiddling, the like, it's good mm -hmm. in the story thing. And um, yeah, they were just great. And then I did, I had two, three days off with them in San Francisco. What did it. you do in San Francisco? I bought weird toys. <laughs> and Dan bought me this amazing, like, golden kimono, which I subsequently wore in some of the shows, my loco shows. Um, cause he was so happy with the song, so oh, yeah. splashed out on me, mm -hmm. and uh, and we just had a yeah, it was just a good time. And do you feel these collaborations with other musicians and other projects? Do you bring something back to your own work from them? Uh, yeah, obviously, and I think every time I work, especially in depth with with a producer. I go in and I think I know why I'm working with them and I don't know why I'm working with them. I don't know them. And it's every time you find out, oh shit, I don't know them. <laughs> and you know, I guess maybe because I was so intimate with, with Mark in the beginning that I assume a sort of intimacy and I assume I know what I'm dealing with. And every time it's a new surprise, like I had no idea. Well, we'll talk about Matthew, I suppose soon, but. I had no idea what his process was until I went in, and it was mind-bending, mm -hmm. and, and, and so on, with everyone, honestly. 
And how about this project in particular? What did you take out of it aside from like, hey, two takes and it was, must have been kind of freeing and liberating in a sense, but what else did you take from the project? Uh, I thought my singing was good because I lifted it up a little bit because I was really under pressure to show off. And uh, a bit like Dusty Springfield would probably have felt in that situation, like I'm not good enough, I better be good, I've got to be better. Um, and because I had such respect for where I was. And also um, the songwriting was straight up soulful songwriting and and I really wanted to do that you know it was getting to the point where I really wanted to do that and this one was very crystallized the way that it came out of me well, let's have a listen this is handsome boy modeling school featuring Roisin with the truth so after the demise of Maloko, you went straight in to do your first solo album with Matthew Herbert. And can you tell me what that experience was like? Did he, do you feel he liberated you in some way? Yes, absolutely. In a funny kind of way, because it was more structured. So um, he would only work sensible hours, uh, so, so 11 o'clock till six. Those were the sort of hours. And um, it was very, very regular. It was every day, five days a week, for about three months. And he, um, he's like that anyway. Everything has a reason. He has a, like a path that he uses. People call it rules, but it's not really, honestly. Jealous people call it rules, trust me. They're like, oh, there's so many rules, I can't be doing with it. It's like, yeah, right. Because your music just sounds like this. Dunker, 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 dunker. And you're jealous, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> but he, he has this magic way, which is like, I went in there, again, not knowing what to expect thinking I knew what to expect but I'm not having any idea and um, he said you know bring something in with you and I thought it was going to be a discussion piece so I brought a article from the newspaper which was about long time and it was something that Brian Eno was very in interested in he put a clock into a rock and it was going to be there for 700 years counting time and it was a statement about how everything's running faster, people are running faster and faster and thinking about time and stuff like that. And I thought it'd be a really interesting conversation. And I went, I brought, and he went, what did you bring? And I went, I brought this. And he went, well, go and hit it on the microphone then. <laughs> <laughs> Make some sound out of it, like, and so rustling it and jumping on it and hitting the microphone with it and all that. And that turned into, if you're in love. It was the first song we did. And I would be too nervous to do, make shit up in front of him, uh, like I did with Mark. So I was also very structured and I worked on a little cassette four track at night when I went home on the track that we'd make together with all the bits and bobs and whatever I brought in, sounds and everything. And, and then I'd write it and then I'd come in and record it the next day and then we'd start another track mm -hmm. and then I'd go home in my night at night and I'd I'd write it and then I'd come back in and it'd all be on the cassette um, but of course magic happened when I interacted with his studio because you used all different types of sounds you made sounds with different types of household objects using your body yeah I mean that must be quite freeing as well yeah because it felt like it felt like he had very open-minded ears and the ears were just like, ka woo! They were like hearing everything and they were loving everything, you know? And that's a very amazing place to be when you are going into a situation like that and I'd only ever done it with Mark uh, and music, that is. And, <laughs> and, and I was worried, you know, 
that I wouldn't be good enough and all this. And he just loved every sound I made. So did he give you confidence with your own voice? He did, and I think also because everything was that little bit more subdued in his music, and I could really hear me. And I do think that he used a particular arrangement of compression and microphone and desk and stuff that very, very, very much suited my voice. Very much. Um, and so when I was singing in that, I felt great, you know. And I felt really like there were tones that were coming out of my voice that I hadn't done since I was a child, you know, since I would sing jazz songs, you know, to me. In the array, people all sing in Ireland, or did then. And all my people sang, and I would sing like, yeah, you know, like uh, Ella Fitzgerald things and stuff like that. And I felt I found those frequencies. I could hear them, the, the way that we were recording. And so, at the same time as being very safe in there with him and protected, and he too is protected by the fabric or the structure of how he works. It's always like, it'll be there. It'll be there. That takes away an awful lot of pain, you know. It'll be there. It'll be there. If I let that fall like that, it'll be there. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's the same with the voice and same with the words and same with the little, writing a song are all little words and frequencies that you just throw down and mm -hmm. it's all there. What a great way to embark upon your solo career. I yeah. think that's really wonderful. And the, the, the product of this, uh, of the two of you pairing together was Ruby Blue, your debut solo album. And you've chosen the song through time. Mm. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful song, you know, and that thing that he does in the middle. And also his harmonies, like the way he got me to do vocal harmonies. Immediately, that do this, mm, do that, mm, do that, mm. and like I would be singing these harmonies, and as they started to stack, I'd be like, huh? "Is that me?" You know what I mean? Like the thing that harmony can do, and he's so good at that, and it's in this, it's beautiful. Well, let's have a listen. This is through time uh, from Roisin's debut solo album, Ruby Blue. This one's easy to cue. Thank you. No. Oh, it's <laughs> I jinxed it. <laughs> Mur Murphy's Law. It is, it is. I would love to listen to the whole thing, but in the interest of time, we have to fast track through, into, through your entire solo career. <laughs> to get to your latest album, which was now released, oh my gosh, over two years ago, which is unreal. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, released by. smack dab in the middle of a global pandemic. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you, you produce great, great albums all, all throughout, you know, the noughties. And we land at Roisin Machine. And this album is so fully realized. Uh, it, you know, I was listening to it again today, and just beginning to end, it is seamless. It really has like a, a, an intent mm. behind it. Mm. What, what was the intent when you embarked upon this record? Well, we embarked upon it 10 years before we sort of started on it in, er in earnest. Uh, we did a few singles along the way, just through the years um, that Parrot was producing for me. And it came out of um, out of overpowered actually. That Roche, I wanted to make Roisin Machine uh, after overpowered. Um, I wanted us to go more house than we'd been more on the boogie disco sort of elements with overpowered. 
and I wanted to really go for it with the house, like proper house, as they say, you know? And I thought Parrot's the best one in the world to do it. So we did simulation and jealousy, yeah. They came out like many, many years before. Years between them as well, I think. And I just think that, why did we not pursue it? Um, there wasn't a reason to. Nobody really cared, honestly. Yeah, I went to, I'm not going to say, but I went to some dance music, I went to one dance music label. And it was like, yeah, we'll put out a single, but you know, you have to give us all the money. And you know, and it was really terrible. So I, d I didn't do it and it sort of put me off for a while. The world wasn't ready somehow to take that fully seriously, I think. Because it was dance music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was house music. Nobody really knew the difference, honestly. There were some people then around that time or maybe a little bit later, like that did start to interest me on that level, like um, Hercules and Love Affair and um, Azarian Third, yeah. and even my partner's uh, act that I did a couple of songs with, um, the Lucasi and Brigante, mm -hmm. this lovely sort of, they did some lovely house, balearic -y kind of house, that was serious and soulful and yeah, so it was about, it was really part of that in the beginning. And, and then I got carried away with making records with Eddie, which I very much enjoyed doing, and I would have played if I had all the night time in the world, I'd play it, something from everything, but, um, and, and I had babies and things like that as well. And I remember sending him Incapable and he was like, scratch, he scratched his head for about a year and a half about it. Eddie or no, Parrot? No, Parrot. Mm -hmm. Like, how can it be a disco song if she says she's incapable? <laughs> Things <laughs> like that. And then suddenly he sent it to me and it was like the best thing ever, you know. The way it just bounced along. The equilibrium in that, in that song. That's why I always say it's like a bouncy ball. Mm -hmm. Sometimes songs are amazing because of that. Everything's just gelling. I can't explain it's it. It's very you. slinky and very sexy. When I play it live, it's just that groove like is so nice. And um, and you know, the character in there, she's not capable of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so she is quite disco, actually. <laughs> but she's a bit higher, you're right. Incapable. <laughs> it's not capable of it. Sorry. But, yeah. She's a character, yeah, it's not really me either. But I like to... I have strength. There's strength in me. Yeah. But songs, like, and going back to Through Time, songs, songwriting is probably more like script writing than it is like uh, writing a book. Because the action has to be the description. The action has to tell the story. So like in Through Time, sort of the action is through time. And that expresses time, as well as says time, as well as mm -hmm. sometimes it's less obvious than that, but something like Incapable is cheeky, like the song's cheeky. It bounces like that personality would bounce. Mm -hmm. Just float through life, you know, yeah. with that song on. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's like, I like things that have traction like that mm. to the music, to the whole mood. Everything explains it. Like in a scene, in a film or on a play, in a play, you don't say, you don't tell people what's happening. You, things happen that you, make the connections between and it tells the story in action so you lead them along yeah 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 well this 
I'm going to play it now because I definitely want to make sure we don't have much time left because we've been chatting so much. Um, and I want to make sure that we have time for our Q&A. One thing I'd like to tell the listeners at home is that if you would like to ask a question, there is a dialogue box uh, in the form below the video window. And you can write your questions in there. And John will be monitoring them. And he'll, he'll um, tell me some of the questions, as, read out some of the questions as well. So let's have a song. Uh, listen to the song Incapable, and you can think of your question that you'd like to, to ask Rasheen. We'll see if we can get to you. Love that song so much. Okay, now it's time for you to ask your questions. Let's see, who has a question? There's a lady right in the back, in the very, very back. Okay, yeah, but I was just thought we'd start back. Thanks. Hi, Rasheen. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you about your collaboration with Matthew Herbert and a performance that you did at the Big Chill quite a long time ago. Yes. When you were tapping a beat with your feet yeah. and layering it. Yeah. And he was layering it up and it developed and developed and developed and it was absolutely refreshing well, it, it, thank and you. exciting. And I wanted to know how that felt to do that live, that kind of process of creation. Doing Ruby Blue live was like going back to the beginning. It was like, oh, how the hell are we going to do this, you know? Um, it wasn't Matthew, by the way. It was Eddie still. It was Eddie Stevens, who was my musical director all the way through, um, that figured it out. And I think Ruby Blue, when a, there's some footage of, of us doing it at the Paradiso in, in Amsterdam. And it really was unbelievable what we did. I only kind of realized recently how uh, uh, it was incredible that we, that mostly Eddie managed to figure out a way to transform the concept of that album into a live, into a live thing. And we took the brass section with us. That was amazing. They were all terrible alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. And, um, and yeah, we just, yeah, there was, an amazing show, actually. I have to give it to Eddie, because nobody was doing that. It was like the, even the technology wasn't really good enough to do it then. You can do it quite easily now, and so it was very, very temperamental. So to uh, to answer how it felt, it felt very dangerous, very temper temperament temperamental, and and when it worked, it was really unbelievable. Sorry. Um. Sorry. <laughs> it was exciting. Yeah, anything could have happened. Yeah, we could sample the wrong thing, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Hi. Oh, is it working? Hi. My name's actually Roshni. So. Oh. oh. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I have a bit of a philosophical question. Yeah. How do you find your calling in life or your purpose? Do you think you found it or do you have any advice? Because you consistently bring so much joy to so many people. So think, how do you think others can do the same? I think I have found my calling because I always wanted to be creative and that was all I ever wanted even growing up. And if you'd asked me when I was a little girl, what do you want to be, Roshi? And I said, artist, I want to be an artist. And um, it was really I was all I was interested in. So I think going to a younger age group to say to, I think the only thing I could say would be surround yourself with good people. I mean, that's point A, really. My journey in music started not as a person making music, but as somebody who surrounded herself with people who were really into music and went to see lots of gigs and bought lots of records and that's all we were interested in. That's all we wanted to know. Well, no, we wanted to know about books and art and all those things as well. But this was the one thing that sort of brought all of us together. Mm. And it's quite a nice thing. I can't say everyone who loves music isn't a psychopath, but <laughs> like, I, I think it's a pretty good indicator if people love, love, love music. And then everything that happened to me happened because of that. I think uh, we have a question from the people watching online. Yeah, we have a question from Adam watching at home. And uh, he loves the Cosmodelica 
I, your remix of Murphy's oh. Law. And it's one of his favorite tunes. And will the sisters of Murphy <laughs> yes, <somebody laughs> be, be working together again anytime soon? Oh, I hope so. But it's such a good mix, man. Thank you. It was Thank one of them much. that just landed on the doorstep that was like, <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Such a huge production and everything. So yeah, it was brilliant. Brilliant mix. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This gentleman right here. And I do it live. I do, I'm doing it live this weekend in Manchester, that one. We've been playing it a lot. <laughs> Thank you. This gentleman right here. We have a microphone yeah. coming. So we can hear you. Uh, long time listener, first time caller, um, <laughs> and um, so it came up a couple of times this evening, I think, uh, around your second album, Statues, I think Matthew Herbert, uh, Ruby Blue was unexpected, and you mentioned that you went to a record company and with a pitch for Roshi Machine, but they weren't quite ready, and it just yeah. seems to be that you're ahead of the curve, right? I'm just wondering, are you aware of how influential you are? on other artists coming through, because I'm just thinking you've gone... No, because they never admit it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, go on. No, no, it, it, like with Gone Fishing, for example, right? Beyonce has just brought out a house album and it's just got like two million hits. Yeah. And you, you did that like, you know, eight years ago. And it's just like, you know, do, do, you, you should get more credit for it. Really. Ah, thank you. That's so nice. That's so nice. This time we're here, yep. I get, I get plenty of credit, though, and honestly, my head would get far too big if I got any more. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hi, Roisin. Hi. Um, there's been a lot of duet albums around, you know, doing the rounds, thinking yeah. of Gaga and Tony Bennett. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to do a duets album, who would you pick? And don't say Tony Christie. Uh, well, I wouldn't. I'm <laughs> only <laughs> <laughs> joking. Um, I don't bloody. I can't, I've never thought. I've never thought about that. Um, I could see myself doing. I know him so well. With uh, somebody like that, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I really, I really don't know. I mean, would, it be, would it be people that you sang to when you were younger, like Sinatra or Ella Fitzgerald? Or? Yeah, I mean, I would love to sing with Frank Sinatra. Yeah. I love Frank Sinatra so much. Mm. Uh, I brought up in a, in a world that loved Frank Sinatra. Everybody. And I heard a lot of it growing up, a lot of it. And a lot of people singing his songs, too. Yeah, he would be he would be a dream to sing with. Because that is possible. something stupid. That, could that, do something <laughs> stupid with him. That that's possible as well, isn't it? With the technology, you could. Do oh it. yeah, you could do an AI one, couldn't yeah. I? Yeah. 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 Oh God, life's too short. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have another question from online. Yeah, we have a question from Madison Fredank, who says your amazing YouTube videos during COVID really brought a lot of joy and fun during that strange period of time. What lifted you up during that time? I was very creative during that time. Um, I um, wrote most of my new record during that time. Uh, not most, well, a good bit of it. And I wrote a good bit of Roisin Machine, actually, during that time. And I wrote other stuff. So I was very creative that way, and then I that just spilled it. That was all in my living room. I was encouraged to get onto Ableton uh, Music Software by the producer DJ Cozy that I've worked with on my recent, my next album, which is finished. Um, and because he works on, he turns Ableton inside out. Like that's how he works. So we did a lot remotely, and um, I did a, I did a lot, and I did a lot of gardening for the first time. <laughs> And now my gardening is starting to show itself. <laughs> yeah, things the, are growing. The fruit of your labors. From two years ago, three years ago, starting, I'm starting to have a real garden here. So, lovely things, actually. I did lots of lovely things. I'm sorry to tell you, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did inspire a lot of people, because, uh, yeah, your performances from your living room. The living your room, yeah. was so inspirational. <laughs> this gentleman here. Hi, Cosmo. Hi, Rosie. 
Hello. Um, right Hello. <laughs> um, so you were talking earlier about uh, lyrics, um, remixes, choosing the remix, or and how to, um, what to play live, what version to play live. Um, we didn't have a chance to talk about hairless toys because mm -hmm. uh, one of my not only my favorite songs of yours, but probably of ever, is "Unpardonable." Yeah. And uh, the the song, the lyrics, like everything. I wanted to know about the process of producing that song. Like you, you know, it stops. It uh, these long notes, and then it has the beat. But then I saw you playing it in um, All Points East, and I was just like hypnotized because you found this incredible electronic version and this riff, um, like really hypnotic bass line. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I just wanted to know how you come about this first uh, version of it, playing with the drama of that song and mm -hmm. then adapting it to such a powerful electronic dance song. Well, Eddie actually remixed it, especially for a live version. There wasn't a mix of it like that. Um, and we wanted to do, I actually wanted to do a much less, a much more vulgar version than he came up with, which is always the case. Um, my, my natural vulgarity is held down by these, these guardians that are around me. So uh, it took me a minute to get used to what he did with it, that live version, but it was really, 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 really good. Yeah, it was good. But I, I was thinking more, let's go more EDM. Let's go more like festival. Because I think that song could be, you know, that, yeah. that like lighter in the air, big festival dance thing, you know. But now he's too tasteful for that, so it didn't turn out. <laughs> <laughs> It was one of them where it's like, I can't do that, Roisin. It happens to me sometimes. I can't do that shite. <laughs> well, we are going to have to wrap it up. So I just want to ask you one last question. You have a new album yes. that's coming out. Any kind of hints as to the musical direction or your intention with it? It really goes in all directions, this one. And... Um, uh, Cozy describes it as a planet, as an entire planet. Um, it's not like Roshi Machine mm -hmm. at all. Uh, it's maybe got more in common with the, Ro with the Ruby Blue. I mean, now he loves that song that I played from Ruby Blue. And he kind of like, sort of like thinks that my voice needs to sound that good all the time. And not many producers really do that. Not many really care and really care what I actually sound like. Um, to the degree that he does, like his ears are just like so sensitive. It's like ridiculous. So you see how when I'm working with someone, this is all reflected into the other the other people that I work with. And so when I'm talking about these albums, I'm like, ah, it's great what they did, <laughs> you know. But it is, you know, and so, yeah, he, he just has to make it sound good. That's it, there's no other rules in, involved in it. There's no, your ego can't get in the way of that. You're not allowed to, if he wants to get rid of something, he'll get rid of it. Is this me explaining what it sounds like? No. Um, what it sounds like, it's, it's very soulful, it's very modern, it's uber modern, and um, it's absolutely brilliant. It's, it's absolutely really, really, really good. <laughs> I'm getting excited now thinking about you hearing it. <laughs> oh, we can't wait to hear it. So thank you to all of you for coming along tonight. It's a pleasure to see all of you. Thank you to the British Library for having us back. It's always a joy to have Classic Album Sundays events here at this iconic, iconic institution. It's always an honor. 
And Roisin, you're so busy right now. Thank you so much. You're at the top of your A game. You are doing so well. I'm so happy for you. And thank you for spending a couple of hours with us here at the British Library tonight for Classic Album Sundays. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.